Hello, so this is a collection of games which I hope illustrate some of the styles of the schools of chess described in the previous video. Starting with uh, Joaquin El Greco, uh, who did have a different surname but everybody calls him El Greco, and, uh, and he didn't really, we don't have really very many games of El Greco, he published analyses um, illustrating how poor play in the opening can be uh, refuted with um, with attacks and this is his perhaps best known and most valuable piece of analysis that uh, in the Italian game uh, trans fast development sees the center with your pawns and uh, uh, so white's done well so far but you don't get anything free in this life black can hit back with uh, bishop to b4 check and if you choose knight to c3 which is greco's preference the greco gambit uh, black can win a pawn um, um, but uh, greco hoped to show in many cases that you can sacrifice pawn sacrifice material much more than a pawn for development than an attack so castles knight takes c3 i mean i think these days we regard bishop takes c3 as better but this is critical and this is the Bernstein variation, uh, played hundreds of years before anybody had heard of Ossip Bernstein. And uh, uh, the little question mark, exclamation mark there, is to say, well, these days we might think Bishop to A3 is better, stopping castling. Um, but uh, uh, nonetheless, Queen to B3, provoking this grab of material um, by Black, Bishop takes A1, uh, so uh, on the board, uh, sorry, off the board, uh, Black has got a rook and two pawns, but here comes the here comes the attack. Uh, check, uh, Bishop to g5, not a3, hitting the queen, and uh, the knight uh, intervenes. Uh, white brings up a knight into the attack. Uh, uh, grab, Black grabs another pawn, might as well. Um, Stockfish sees little wrong with this. Uh, and now we threaten checkmate. Um, we intervene with uh, uh, black blocks the uh, checkmate from the queen with the pawn check and now we win at peace back at least and uh, now there's all sorts of threats to uh, play a discovered check and mate um, so bishop takes e5 check and now the bishop can block with uh, uh, placing itself on f6 but of course to take it and now to recapture leads to mate if the king runs away, uh, now black has a um, uh, still has an advantage nom uh, nominally and material, but they're getting mated and it's uh, and it all, uh, all, all falls around down around their head. Actually, it might not be mate, but there's a black is going to have to give up considerable material to avoid checkmate here. So that's that's how Greco like to play. You know, development sees the centre. Don't be afraid to attack, and uh, if, if you're defending, my goodness, don't don't keep grabbing material in the hope that you'll be all right if you have no development. Um, I'm going to skip to uh, the Romantics uh, now, and here's a game, Anderson Kizaritsky. He played a this this game was played in uh, the London tournament of 1851, the first uh, international chess tournament, and uh, after all, uh, this tournament. Anderson played an absolutely fantastic game against Kizaritsky, um in the cafe afterwards. Um, this isn't it. This is actually how he played when he was being serious and not uh, indulging in flights of fancy. Um, but you'll see it's fanciful enough. Uh, the same opening as this is for the famous immortal game. Uh, <coughs> White doesn't mind having the king move because we'll get a hit against the queen at some point and black throws back a pawn in order to uh, divert the bishop from its best square and to develop the, his own bishop. Uh, so if there's the hit against the queen and the queen is now not ever so well placed on h6. Uh, so lots more development uh, from white sees the centre and I think you know white's fairly well achieved their opening aims in this position. Uh, it looks pretty good um, despite the misplaced king. Uh, black goes after keeping that pawn, um, knight h5, and uh, white contests it, and uh, and then tries to open up the centre against the uh, black king. Um, black gets back in the centre, now castles, and white conceives of an attack down the g-file, and uh, 
Now, not that all of these moves are accurate, and Stockfish spends a little bit of time piddling over these moves um, in its annotations, but uh, the uh, I guess the, the, the point is not to say, is this a brilliant game, but I mean, this is how they played, um, which was, you know, so here's a, here's a sacrifice um, of the knight, the queen goes, there's a, uh, the knight comes into uh, f5 to attack the queen, and uh, there's a discovered attack happening with the knight, which might be checkmate, who knows, um, and if we take, then we take the queen, and now the game kind of settles down a little bit, not an awful lot, but a little bit, and uh, and now we have a position where uh, white has um, uh, two rooks and black has a uh, two knights and a rook, and uh, sorry, two, two knights against the the rook. Now that may be a, an advantage theoretically in terms of uh, how valuable the two knights are compared with the rook. Two knights are a three each and a rook five. But black, uh, sorry, white's got some pawns uh, for it, including a very powerful pass pawn on e5 and actually also what matters is the coordination um so a black piece is the same come over here someone can say let's go over there and the coordination matters um so white's out to pinch that knight and uh, black plays a desperate series of annoying checks to try and stop that happening chasing the white king all over the place and then eventually throws uh, uh throws in the uh, rook to save the knight and um, now we've got a position two rooks against three pieces again you might think that's rough material equality but again coordination matters and also what matters is that past pawn so I mean actually a very exciting game all sorts happening in there which I won't pick apart in this video but that's the style um, you know no, no, a fearless risk taking um, with, uh, with a lot of dash um, and when Steinitz beat Anderson, he played in that same style. So here's a Steinitz Anderson game, King's Gambit. Um, the uh, this Hanstein variation. Now you can castle here, which is the Museo Gambit, but uh, White plunges ahead with uh, Knight to e5. Again, this check that White thinks they can survive. Grab the centre uh, and. Uh, uh, and now um, Black's been allowed to keep their f pawn, and in fact seems to have got a lock on the king side. Um, but does it last? Uh, can it last? Uh, let's let's see. Um, so h3, break, trying to break up the up pawn. Uh, this is another tactic Greco would use. Um, so uh, a discovered attack. Sorry, uh, undermining the uh, the G pawn and now taking it, and now the F pawn looks a bit more vulnerable. Now it's getting chased around, and uh, uh, Black hitting back hard. Um, a characteristic Steinitzian move of the king, trying to defend itself, and uh, and after some shuffling about, the game has actually quietened down a lot with with the many exchanges, and now White has. Um, as a kingside initiative, uh, which they hope to make stick. Um, I mean, more inaccuracies that Stockfish doesn't like, but um, that's not uh, uh, not to be not not unexpected. And uh, with this powerful attack, Black is uh, trying to make some sort of counter counter attack, chasing the White King all over the place again. Very Steinitzian way of defending. Um, but uh, White's lock on the king side is strong and does win. And in this position, Black resigned because they're getting mated, or they have to give up the queen, or both probably. Um, so that's how Steinitz used to play. That was his for his match against Anderson in 1866. Move on a little bit to Vienna in 1873, uh, and Steinitz just plays in a different way. Uh, so Queen's Gambit, this shift across the board to, uh, of the, uh, uh, from the King's Gambit to the Queen's. And this is not dashing, this is not um, sacrificial, this is patient development with a strong centre 
um, developing lots of the queen side pieces first and seeking, um, not as Pillsbury would do in this position, a king side attack with knight e5. Uh, Pillsbury would practice this later in the 1800s, uh, in the 19th century. But uh, but going for uh, exploiting these uh, pawn weaknesses, the, the hanging pawns that we see there. So queen a4, and uh, uh, perhaps black doesn't defend in the in the best way, but uh, uh, um, we have this strong set of uh, strong sense that white is not trying to win initially by a direct attack, they're initially trying to win by gaining positional advantages, open files, weak pawns, that sort of stuff. And only later do they turn to uh, trying to cash in. And uh, in this position, Black's doing their best to counter-attack because their position is falling apart, but there are a couple of pawns down. And that bishop is not a, not a happy piece. Uh, not only because it's blocked, but I think it's about to drop off the board. Um, so now Black is you know, thrashing around trying to do, make a mess, but in fact just gets the rook stuck. So that's the latest line. It's uh, very positional, uh, very controlled, and playing the Queen's Gambit. The, uh, and that's the classical school. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of uh, Lasker and Capelbanker games you might look at uh, to exemplify that as well. But uh, uh, Imre Koenig, in his book Chess from Morphy to Botvinnik, describes that as kind of the beginnings of modern chess, which is a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, that's uh, positional play for you. Um, so here's a game from Nimzovic, which I think is, uh, uh, illustrates perhaps his best game, but also how he would handle the opening. Um, so c4, not, e, not e4, not d4, these two opening moves that we've relied on for so long. Uh, but the English opening, uh, don't occupy the centre straight away, but uh, seek to excuse me, control it by the, from the sides. Um, Rubinstein sees the centre as, as he believes he should. And now e4 from white, uh, creating a backward uh, d pawn and uh, kind of inviting black to say uh, to come in on um, d3 with a check. So this d pawn is, is very backward and very weak, but Nimzovich is saying, well, yeah. <laughs> and uh, But the, the position is sound. Um, so uh, we have, uh, you know, Rubenstein occupying d4, the weakness, the weak square on d4 as he should, but actually now the weakness is blocked and not there anymore. And the weight of the game, the, 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 the focus of the argument of the game shifts to the king side, um, where white is well mobilised. And uh, this amazing move, knight to h1, um, heading for g5, and to say something about the uh, king side. And uh, we have a, some discussion about the e file as well, but now uh, white, uh, white reminding black about some of their weaknesses on the king side. Nearly all black's pieces are on the queen side. And uh, so white's teasing black about that and comes back to d4 to, uh, to attack d4 rather and misplace black's. Um, Bishop, which now is a bit of a tall pawn. Uh, back to the king side. Again, Stockfish doesn't like that move, but uh, uh, let's give Winnipeg his head. Uh, rook to e5, <coughs> and uh, now with the defender of g5 removed, <coughs> uh, White can move in, uh, switches back to the e file, and a check, and now. Uh, White's got some sort of mating threat with knight to e6 and then uh, check on f6. Um, but I think the black king can kind of escape by playing h5 and uh, uh, running with the queen. Let's have a little look at that. Um, uh, that uh, well, let's, 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 let's look at the next move by White. So. White's playing b5, an amazing move, right over on the queen side. And the idea is to get the bishop around to this square, which will finish off black. So b5, and if takes uh, this knight h6, check, the, the black king runs away, check. 
um, but now bishop to b4 coming in on f8 uh, will kill it off. So uh, that doesn't happen, and instead uh, black has to give up the piece, so the rest of the game holds uh, little interest with that uh, uh, extra piece. So, well done, so a different style of handling the opening, and rather uh, an inventive way of handling the middle game. Uh, Botvinnik was the dominant figure in Soviet chess for many years. This is a game played in, just checking quickly, 55. Um, but Botvinnik turned the English opening into a, a powerful weapon <coughs> uh, in the 1940s. And, uh, and this is a formation known as the Botvinnik system. But I think you can see here, heavily influenced by Nimzovic, accepting this uh, backward pawn on, on the D file. Now you might expect um, White to want to uh, play D4 here to try and get rid of the, the backward pawn, but uh, Bokvinik is quite happy with the backward pawn. The centre's locked, and with the centre locked, play will transfer to the wings, and that's where Bokvinik will attack, and he actually makes this look like a a forced win. Iron logic, uh, deep research, and very powerful play, and uh, Bot Botvinnik punches this attack home. Um, uh, after g5, um, the uh, knight is the only thing that's stopping f6 and a mate on, f uh, on g7. Uh, we'll swap off the knight if we can, and if the knight retreats, f6 is good knight nurse. So that's, that's very Botvinnik. Um, another very Botvinnik game <coughs> uh, here. Um, Black has no advantage for a lot of this game, but look at this hyper-modern chess. The Grunfeld giving up the centre um, in the hope of hitting back. So White's got a strong centre, but there's Black pounding back at it and declaring that uh, Black has a full share of the chances, and indeed that seems to be the case. So, uh, um, Black still not trying to occupy the centre uh, at all, but control it from the sides with these Fianchiso bishops. <coughs> and, uh, and now, with the extra, uh, with, with space on the queen side, and with extra mobility on the queen side, uh, punches home a queen side attack. And again, this all looks very powerful, very logical, and uh, we, uh, we sneak in a mate. Uh, so uh, that's, that's Botvinnik for you. And I think it's hard not to learn from Botvinnik's games. So that's the, the through line of the chess development as described. But let's go back a, back a few. Um, here's Philidor with this very pawn-led um, positional chess, uh, playing black here against a guy called Smith. And, uh, and you can see here now that, you know, it's, it's pawn play. Pawns are the soul of chess, he said. And uh, this is him playing as he, he means to play. Um, and, you know, <coughs> I could imagine myself screaming at a, a, a one of the Devon Juniors saying, you know, dip up what, what your rook's doing in the corners, get your bits out. But Philidor is in no hurry to do this, and uh, the rook on h1 may be well placed where it is. So it's, uh, yeah, it doesn't castle, you know, connects the rooks by moving the king. And it's all about these little pawn pushes to gain space and uh, activity. Now, I think the reality is, in this position, um, Black's play has been quite pretty, but uh, is not um, totally convincing. I uh, think Black's got a nice position, but White's not bad, and White's set up their defences to cope with all of White's, uh, White, uh, Black's uh, funny little pawn moves. So, uh, although Black does win this game, um, I think this is more about the strength of Philidor as a chess player than it is about uh, these fancy these fancy themes. I mean, I think by now um, the king side's fallen apart, and uh, Black is 
is going ahead um, with two pieces now against a rook and with uh, white full of weaknesses. The, the rooks are not going to enjoy defending this position at all. And in fact, uh, white slips a mate. But that's the style. You know, it's not to say the, this is brilliant play, but that's the, to give you a sense of the style. And here's Howard Staunton, um, a disciple of Philidor, playing um, not the English opening, but again a, a flank opening, birds opening as it's now known, and, uh, and playing the fianchetto. So not concerns to occupy the centre as Black has done um, very early. Um, double fianchetto and uh, the E and the D pawns are held back until a later stage in the game. Uh, Keen and Coles, who wrote a book about Staunton, um, oh, another flank blow, uh, showed this game to some guys at uh, a uh, tournament, I think in the 1970s, and said, well, guess who's playing white here? And they all guessed modern players. They guessed Glass and they guessed Barcher. And, uh, but of course, it's Howard Staunton playing, you know, flank openings and delayed occupation of the centre uh, hundreds of years, not hundreds, a long while before the, uh, uh, the hypermoderns invented it later. <laughs> so, uh, uh, this is a, so this is a nicely, a nice fine game by uh, White playing a, a, there's a little tactic there, so if now check, uh, if White can take on um, C4 with check, I'll pick up the bishop, but actually chooses to chase away the knight first, which allows the bishop to escape. So White still sounds better here, um, but uh, not as advantageous as it could be. I mean, it just games our flaws. But this is um, this is the English style. This is positional. It's slow. It's uh, it's got some elements of uh, the hyper modern game, uh, anticipating their ideas much later on. And, uh, and now, uh, with the advantages accumulated, um, the, the position is, is right for a, a win. Um, so that's the other through line in chess, the English school from Philidor. <coughs> and, uh, and do please be aware, this is very much a, a cartoon. It is a caricature of chess. So that, uh, I mean, I'll give you a, a, a contradictory uh, game. This is, um, well again you could, you could guess uh, who played this game, um, a line of the Scotch Gambit which turns into a line uh, we might get from uh, the two knights defence and uh, in this position uh, black has uh, a bishop against the knight, not a great bishop to be honest with those central pawns on white squares. Uh, but black has got doubled pawns, doubled backward pawns on an open file, and the rest of the game is uh, uh, white methodically seeking to exploit uh, that advantage while keeping black's attempts to create something on the king's side under control. And, uh, and this was played by Adolf Anderson, the great romantic, the great dashing player of the immortal and the evergreen games, um, against... Uh, uh, Daniel Harvitz, uh, one of the romantics of the, uh, the the dominant French school at the time from the Café de la Régence in Paris, uh, Deschapelles and uh, all these guys. So Harvitz was uh, considered to be one of their, their best player and uh, here he is being quietly taken apart by a, a Queen's side attack. And, uh, uh, and now Black is completely tied up, and I think White can walk their walk their king over towards the uh, queen side and tie Black up further. It's uh, um, the, the ending is lost for Black. So it, the, the the caricature is not the whole story, but it's certainly if you want to make sense of these terms that are thrown around like romantic and classical and hypermodern. Those are some games to illustrate what they're talking about. Uh, bye for now.